Welcome to the Knock on Archery podcast, where we bring all archers and bow hunters together from all walks of life with the goal to educate, empower, and inspire you to be better both in the field and on the range. Bro, it's official. I'm video podcasting. First time ever? First time ever. Welcome to the show. (laughs) I guess this show or the metaphorical bigger show, I don't know. It's too yeah. early in the morning to decide what show I'm talking about. I know. I'm wondering if people are going to be disappointed in the in the stump dud podcast when <laughs> we did an early morning podcast, so we're kind of more in our morning fog mode rather than... We can always revisit later. This could just be <laughs> part one of today. We yeah. come back for part two this evening and say wildly... Well, I would say wildly inappropriate things. You're definitely more professional than me when? on the podcast medium. You think? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah, you you go on a rope sometimes. Sometimes I get worried about you. I don't. I know you don't. <laughs> I know you don't. Yeah. Sometimes I'm like, oh boy, here we go. But I th- I think you like that. You welcome the. You welcome the chaos, the media chaos. From I just speak from the heart, and sometimes I think people suck. How different is it for you? Like the fact that we're sitting here now. Got a, you know, I've got a video studio. You've got a video studio. Like, do I you have an interim video studio. I got plans. Who was your first? Who was your first podcast host? I can't remember. guest Ron Ortiz, a guy I knew from the CrossFit world. Actually, the first two were yeah. CrossFit world. The second was Josh Bridges. Yeah, that's right. Firefighter though, Ortiz. Uh, Ron Ortiz. Is a beast. He's ridiculous. He looks. He kind of. How much bigger was he than like? Have you ever looked at old videos of Tosh? Brian Chantosh? Yeah, when he was he was he was a soldier. Yeah, out. he was a soldier for a while. Um <laughs> weight stack brigade. He Ortiz is much taller. He looked tall. Top. Like he looks tall, but then compared to Bridges, I feel like anybody, everything does. This yeah. table looks tall in comparison to Bridges. <laughs> um like a magnitude of order. Hmm. Larger than he's just Ron is just a towering beast of a man. He looks like that, so I've always wondered if that was the case. Yeah. Well over six feet tall. Dude, think back to where we started. Like, even when we we did, I think it was a Cleared Hot podcast with Tosh, me, you, and Tosh in Texas. Yeah. And we were just in that little room. You had, like, your first, both of us had little I think it was a little Zoom setup. Yeah, man. Yeah. I might have had the headsets by that point, though. Of course you did. You've always been one step ahead. Anything tech-wise? Tech yeah, tech <laughs> dork, tech dork. Tech I'm not a dork. tech dork. I'm interested by tech, and I was trying to figure out. I went through an evolution. My first podcast setup was maybe a third the size of this. I would say that's a cutting board, but is that a cutting board? It's actually a display board. Yeah. Yeah. but A third the size of that. And it had little mic stands with little mics with little pop filters that a, uh, a brand I was working with created it for me. And a Zoom. I think the first podcast I ever tried to record, like the batteries died on it. So I lost most of the Dude. audio, if not all. Of, I've like, think of how many podcasts we lost, like, like the dumbest thing. Forgot to have <laughs> your mic plugged in. <laughs> batteries fell out, uh, you know, trusted the batteries. Power surges, which is still a high possibility even right now. Never trust the batteries. Yeah. That's why I saw that. I was like, waz, damn. <laughs> All right. I know. I like it in here, though. This is cool. It's I, very cool. Yeah. The cameras won't be able to pick up, like, you know, Joe over there. Uh, <laughs> Did you know that was him? I didn't. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Yep, I know what that picture is from. That's from the sauna because that's the face he makes. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. That's pretty <laughs> awesome. He's coming out of the sauna right there with his bow. Yeah, I'm going to take a hard pass on that. No, it's cool, man. No, it's come a long way. I, I mean, I you're using the Roadcaster Pro, which is a great yeah. podcasting board. I get asked all the time about where you should start. And I tell you, could can start with just a phone, actually. Yeah, we've done it. Be prepared for the audio quality. Have you ever listened to a podcast that somebody's recorded while driving their car? I want to say I would never do that, but I just need to make sure I haven't actually had to do it out of desperate weight. I've done it. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, if you haven't listened to it, don't waste your time. Just skip <laughs> it because it sounds like you're driving a car. I think I did it with uh, Jim Miller. We had like a three and a half hour drive 
from uh, Bear Camp down to Vancouver. Yeah. And so we just put the phone like in between the two on of you? the dash. <laughs> That's so unacceptable. <laughs> no, it wasn't. You know, you and I have had to do stuff like that. So not anymore. Not anymore. But you, you could start there with the smartphone you have, and then you could go the Zoom, and then the Roadcaster, and then the setup now, which you have all the pieces for. We'll get you dialed in. We'll get you there. Yeah. I but mean, the setup I, you saw at the studio, it's already different. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> What's different about it? The kegger? <clears throat> the kegerator, well, it's obviously not part of uh, the show itself. I upgraded the cameras because I'm trying to get to the point where, much like Joe, my editor can sit there and do it live. Yeah. Yep. Which will doesn't actually save any time, but it just means that the product is ready to upload faster. Yeah, so you've did, you've done really well on scheduling. That's I, I think you being home more, your consistency on scheduling helps a ton. I didn't have anything else to do. <laughs> <laughs> I was stuck in Montana, which is not a bad place to be stuck. But no, I did. I met almost two years of every Monday for the conversation. Yeah. Episodes and then 55 weeks in a row of the full auto Fridays. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's good. I think the consistency is important. I think it helps. For me, it, it's a, always a struggle just because I'm gone a lot. Well, know? the hunting season for you, you're off the grid. Yeah, goodbye. So I will be more active this hunting season as well, so I'll just bank them. I'll try to bank. For, I think the farthest I've ever been ahead is like five weeks. Yeah, I've had a few emails about my post yesterday where I just – you know, was happy that you were back. And I've I guess for the been around, I was just doing other things. <laughs> you, you were around, but you weren't around. Obviously you went through, you know, you've talked about it, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. So you went through a divorce. It was, I mean, I can honestly say it was horrible. And well, you were right there from the very beginning. Yeah. Like sitting there making the decision as what I needed to do with my life moving forward. And yeah. then the execution of that, which was, rough i remember that yeah i remember there was like two days of that like discussing it talking about it yep and we were we were way off the grid and then i remember the two of us driving that boat and like in your mind you had made your your mind up and i could see you like thinking about how everything was going to have to go forward and the decision i mean i'm not going to say the decision was easy i was worried about the logistics yeah well yeah i think Anytime you go through something like that, there's going to be logistics, especially if you have kids complicated, but yeah, yeah I remember like giving you an extra squeeze on the, when I hugged you goodbye. Cause I kind of knew, all right, he's getting ready to go. <laughs> he's getting ready to go on a nasty deployment right here. The vision quest, if you will. <laughs> yeah. God, it sucked. And it, it, yeah, it got pretty rough there. And there's times where I'm like, bro, haven't heard from you. Are you okay? At least say like I'm good. <laughs> and you're yeah. like, you're like, I'm okay. But what are you gonna do to help me? And, uh, I can give you a hug. No, it was a journey. The whole process took just under two years because we were just talking about that. <laughs> just under two years. Um, I would tell people avoid it at all costs. But if it's the right decision to make, it may not be best to delay the inevitable. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're back. You, you are like, you're honestly now walking around all the time, like the Andy that I knew when we would go places, and all that weight that was on you from everything that was going on. Like that's when you would get away from it, and I could tell, like, yeah, uh, you know, okay, you know, fun bunk Andy's in the house. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing I didn't realize looking back. Um, I one of the reasons I'm traveling less is I have less reason to travel. Yeah, and uh, and that was a, I'm not saying that was forced by somebody else. That was a choice that I was making that I didn't realize I was making. I was using the travel as an escape from a situation that I was obviously willingly in. That I personally think I stayed in. I'd say about ten years. Yeah. Too long, but there's a lot of compounding decisions that went into that to include oh, sure. my kids and everything that was yeah. going on. And I'm glad that I stayed until I did in many respects because that's why I live where I live now and I know the people that I know now. Yeah, yeah, but, it could have been scary for you if, like, SBG wouldn't have been there. Yeah, you that know, was a unless huge... Unless I would have said, like, hey, fly out to Iowa. You can clutch arrows. 
Mm, I would have quit within like two hours. <laughs> also, you would have fired me because I put them on backwards or on the wrong end of the arrow. I mean, you know how I do archery stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but it, uh, yeah, I was managing my stress with travel. And now it's like, why do I want to, I don't want to travel. I actually have two trips for the rest of the year scheduled, both business related, both one day long. And that's it. And I'm turning down almost everything except for our hunt. And I'm just being very cautious with my time. Did you, did you go to counseling at all? A lot. Yeah. Did. Okay. No, I see a counselor every, I talk, well, I don't go see him because we do it over the computer. I started seeing him in person, then COVID went blah and uh, messed up everything. But I, so my ex and I, th- my first intro to counseling was when I got hurt at work. They made me go see a shrink or a psych. It was super fast. He actually asked, he was more interested in my recall of the events, which, um, I was able to recall. It's not, it's not like the first time I had been in that situation. And then uh, my ex and I had gone through a couple bouts of marriage counseling or therapy. And I really enjoyed the process of sitting and talking with somebody who could. I think the best thing about uh, marriage counseling is that you get to talk to somebody else who then says something to somebody else who may be willing to hear it from somebody other than yeah. you. Mm-hmm. Or they can approach from a different angle. So I enjoyed that. And then when I left... Uh, we made the decision, my ex and I, to make sure all three of the kids were seeing a counselor. And one of them was uh, kind of butting their head up against it. And I realized that the best thing that I could do was just show them that I'm as equally committed. Yeah. So I started talking to a counselor. Huge impact just for like the objective third party view of it. And uh, and then just never stopped. Yeah, that's awesome. I never knew that, but I never asked you. Yeah. A lot but- of people don't feel comfortable talking about that. And it's not like, you know, I'm not sitting there like, I don't think I've ever had... I mean, I'll have emotional swings just like anybody else does, and you'll have highs and lows, but I think a lot of times you see counseling in the movies where it's like you're sitting there with a bag of tissues and you're like, you know, you're just completely falling apart. That hasn't been my experience at all. I like to have somebody that I can talk to, absent any judgment, who's then going to go talk to somebody else anyway. So, like, I have, like, that hour of time, and they can, like, pop around in my head with the flashlight a little bit. Or oftentimes, it's, uh, like, with my kids. So I have three kids Almost 18, almost 16, almost 13. Julia turns 13 next week. Mm-hmm. So all three of my kids will be teenagers, and one's now knocking on the door, leaving the house. A lot of the times I'm sitting there talking, like, hey, do you have any suggestions about how I could approach this topic? At, at this age in development, What? how could I approach this in a way that's going to make sense to them? So it's not like, I mean, the divorce sucked, obviously. Yeah. And, you know, working through those issues, those were highs and lows involved in that, but... Once you start down the process, it's not like it's a new thing. Like you basically just have to work through it. Most of my questions were like, Hey, I want to kill this person. How do I, how would you recommend I not do that? <laughs> <laughs> and for clarity, I was talking about the same person over and over again. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the way that you're communicating now, I can hear a lot of that coming out because it, it's nice to hear you like processing everything that was going on you're processing things way different even through the two days that we've been close enough together again to where we're talking about stuff like that I'm like okay well he's he's actually coming at a lot of these things from a way different angle but your support network has been awesome I was uh, myself and obviously a bunch of our mutual friends were all worried about the fact that we weren't close to you and you were that far away and we all knew it was like sucked and You know, the one person, the one person more so than, than any was Evan was like, he a hundred percent, a hundred percent will be like, he'll come out of this fine, like a hundred percent. But there was definitely times where you went quiet for a long time where people were like, okay, what's going on? And it was nice. It was nice at least that you had SBG to where, you know, if I knew you were regular to that, you were okay where I could exercise my desire to kill people in a simulated fashion. <laughs> no, it helped. I mean, I, of course, you know, shortly into the divorce process, it's like, Hey, let's throw a pandemic on top of this, which is also by the way, going to destroy, um, 50% of your ability to do what you used to do professionally. Mm-hmm. And it's not like you talk about money at all in a divorce. So that didn't make it complicated. <laughs> and, uh, And the gym did shut down for about nine weeks. And for me, I have to be physical. Like I have to, I just come from, I mean, I played sports in high school. I was obviously very active in my military career from just being physical. It's just a Mm -hmm. a difficult job. 
you throw me in isolation where I don't have the ability to sweat or do something like that, I, I'll start to come apart because of that more than any other issue external. Like at most, if I can have that, you could throw almost any issue at me you want to. You take away that physical aspect, the, the wheels come off the bus pretty quick. I've had a few times in the last probably two months. I mean, and it's happened a lot over over the course of, I call it my career, but just my life, where I know I'm not training at the rate that I want to, and it that starts to derail me to where I'll get, like, moody, getting upset. Oh, yeah. And I, and I just, I'm telling people, like, I know I haven't done, you know, I haven't worked out as much as I want. I haven't been shooting as much as I need. I have to just tell everybody no, and, you know, and we did Prioritize that. Prioritize yourself. Yeah, we did that. Um, actually, we did that about a month ago. You know, Sharon and I just kind of had like a, a big team powwow and just said, listen, John is not going to like do not contact before 10 o'clock, you know, he because normally people know I'm up early. So as soon as I – as soon as I work out, like I have to work out before I turn my phone off airplane mode. That's like my rule. So as soon as I work out and turn that my airplane mode off, then all of a sudden it's just everyone knows. An like ambush, like, if you will. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so we had to just kind of tell people, listen, we're you know I need to be able to. It's a lot of time. I mean, it's a lot of time to to go to the gym. It's a lot of time to, you know, be up at first light, try to like, for me, I call my stretching, having a coffee and getting in the hot tub. Like that's me just trying to get loose and, you know, get deal the wheels with, and yeah, gears turning. Yeah. Get everything <laughs> turning. And then once that happens, I can get a second cup of coffee and, you know, I can go out and just start practicing and try to just try to try to at least shoot enough to where I know I've like polished, you know, it's, I don't really have a specific training routine, but I just know, I know how much I need to do to feel confident to where if I had to go shoot right now in front of people, which, you know, obviously with the tack, that's going to happen. Um, I just have to be on point, you know, yep. on point or within, within reason. And I know like there's definitely times where, you know, if someone just gave you, you know, a freaking AR right now and a pistol and said, Hey, we're going to, you know, let's do a tactical thing. There's your motor skills are going to have you at probably 80% capacity anyway, which I know deep down when it comes to shooting a bow, I'm probably 80% where I want to be most of the time. Yeah. But if I know that I haven't put in any effort to be above that, it's it's like really gets at me. And the same's true even with with like lifting. I know with workouts now, it seems like the older I get, the recovery time is equally important to the to the workout time. Yep. Otherwise, I can just overtrain myself, and that's maybe it's my size or or whatever. But that's the truth. And and I'm trying to balance serious shooting sessions on top of that. So just Having that routine for me is part of the sanity too. So I think it was awesome that you were able to have that schedule too, to where you knew, like you knew, hey, this is when my class is. 12 yeah. to 2 every day I prioritize for myself. Yep. Which is not that much time in the, you know, the total time of a day or a week, but I will take 12 to 2. Even when people will fly in to do podcasts, like, hey, what time do you want to meet? 2.30. Every time that's when yeah. I record podcasts because I will finish a class, do open mat, change out, grab a bite, walk the block to the podcast studio, yeah. meet him there. And it's, it's just, I have to do that. Otherwise it just comes unwound for me. Well, you did an important thing too. You set yourself up for convenience. Oh yeah. Because that's when people are trying to build a habit or when people are trying to create a new, a Anything. new lifestyle, right? Yeah. If you if you don't make it convenient for you to be able to do it, it, the likelihood of you being regular on it is drastically different. And that's why like every one of the places that I have where I make stops throughout the day, 
every one of them has the ability for me to build a bow, shoot a bow, write on a chalkboard. Yeah. You, know. you have chalkboards everywhere. Yeah. I have to because otherwise, like, sometimes small things like I'll be working out and then all of a sudden I'll have a name in my head for, a, you know, a new product that I know is coming. And if I don't, like, write that and circle it big, then it's, it's like, lost in the abyss. So, yeah, I have that stuff around me. And a lot of times once I start writing something, I can keep going on it too. Yeah. It I don't was, do that. I just let things go into the abyss. But I generally don't have like revelatory ideas either. Well, I was, I was, I knew in the back of my mind that I was getting behind on like bow builds or getting behind on people that have been saying like, "Hey, can I come out and get lessons and like do a build?" And how so, do you even have time for that? I really don't. But I, you know, if it's if it's the right people, like I'm obviously you called and said like, Hey, I'm, I want to bring some people that, yeah. you know, that want to learn. So but we had to, we mean, we had to look far in advance though too. I mean, yeah. Which is, I mean, that's what I wanted to do is like, Hey man, in the next few months, <laughs> let me know. But I mean, I think we said that in like November. Yeah. That's when we first started talking about it. So yeah, it's, it's almost end of June. May. Yeah. In the May now. But yeah, I, I think I, it bothers me more if I have to turn people down that I know are good for archery, you know, and there's a lot, there's honestly, I can't do everyone that asks, but you know, and normally in the back of my head, I'm like, okay, I got, I've got like, well, for you, it was like, I got Andy and I know I've got him coming. And I had him like, I had your name written down on the board, but then I, I actually went through one day while I was working out. Cause I've got, well, I think I've got like 16 feet of, chalkboards in my gym mm -hmm. so i was just i started like okay dig in your brain and start writing down everything everyone you have commitments to and really quick it was like 16 you know including including you guys but there was four of you but yep. there was a lot of individuals and then honestly once i saw it i'm like okay i for sure have to say no to people i don't want to say no to I've just got to say, listen, honey, you know, I've got all these tacks in a row. And for me, those are, I call them, you know, it's like, I feel like I have to be on. I almost, I don't know if this is right, but I kind of feel like a performer, so to speak, just because I know how many people want to just come and like watch me shoot. Because if I pull my bow back, there's like a beep going on somewhere. Someone's filming it, you know, so I feel like. I feel like I need to represent good shots all the time. Mm -hmm. And so all that takes time. And if I'm distracted at the tax, that's problematic. Like I just learned, I learned as a competitor that when, when life had the ability to put distractions at, at an event, I just didn't have a, I shouldn't be there at that capacity, you know, because I knew that I had distraction in the back of my mind. I knew I wasn't a hundred percent focused on competing. And the reality is I know there are people there. Like there's a couple dozen people there that a hundred percent have extreme focus and they know right wh why they're there and they're not jacking around with people at dinners and they're, you know, they're freaking, they're on the practice field, they're practicing, they want to freaking win and they want to win a check. And then it just got to the point for me where I, that was became like second. I liked being there and I loved part of that, but I also knew that I'm not like, I wasn't really hungry for that. And then for me, that just kind of became you know, not life threatening, but it came a dangerous situation of you're kind of just out here going through the motions yep. and going through the motions can kind of be disastrous. Cause I feel like one, you have the ability to make a mistake, you know, and, and, like for me, I feel like it, it could have got to the point where if I pushed too hard, I could have like dug myself into like target panic just because I knew that I wasn't serious enough. But you try to be serious when it's like go time, but there's just missing parts and it doesn't flow. And then it seems like it gets dangerous. Have I you ever it, had that? Yeah, I actually advise people to stop whatever it is that they're doing and find something else. If you get to a point where you're just going through the motions. Yeah. 
Well, I think target panic is awesome in other people. I love it. I know. And as much as I, as much as I like try to coach <laughs> ways to, to not have problematic things in the future. It's a personal journey. You have to go through it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there was, there was a time yesterday with, uh, with Denver to where I seen when his thumb come off the safety. And of course it was within the first 20 minutes of me actually letting him aim on a site. And I just, I mean, it was like a millisecond and I had to just say, okay, dude, you know, that second voice that just came in and talked said now. Yeah. (laughs) Freaking never listen to that person again. So hard to do. Even with the right, so Denver knows an incredible amount about pistols and rifles, and he's done a lot of training in that space. So he'll understand the mechanics, but it's it's the same thing. That's why I think the uh, you've worked with quite a few military guys. I think it's easy for them to understand your vernacular yeah. because it's not that complicated. And uh, you probably heard me say it a couple of times yesterday. The difference is you're under load. There's just yeah. a lot more to it's like. Oh, line your sights up. That's easy with a rifle. I mean, just lay down and put it on a bipod and. Or set it over on the ground if you're not ready yet. Yeah, just like, like take a, a nap cactus. on the buttstock real fast and then wake up. Oh, this. Oh, my sights are still aligned. Yeah, just do that when it's trying to collapse your shoulders on you. It's not. <laughs> it's not the same thing at all. And then you, you know, eighty things that you're trying to think about. Which, I mean, again, I'm not an archery coach, but maybe don't try to think about eighty things all while it's just trying to snatch your soul away from you. <laughs> and I like it when they lose control. When I can watch people shaking like a dog shitting a razor blade. I love it. You shot so good yesterday. I hadn't shot in months. I know. I could, I mean, I knew, I knew by looking at your setup that it had dust on it, you know, and it hadn't been really getting pounded. But I also was kind of curious, like, how's his execution going to be? And, dude. I just do the same stuff every time. It's not complicated. Yeah. Maybe it is complicated, but you don't have to make it any more complicated. Yeah. You don't overcomplicate it. You just go back to like, what I originally told you. Yeah. And I think what's been helpful for you too, is you've actually had follow-up, not by me, like coaching you all the time, but you get follow-up because you've brought a lot of people to me. And then you've kind of sat in while that whole process yep. develops. So, cause you got to see it with Jocko, right? Who else? Trevor, Trevor. Oh, that's right. I mean, well, the three Evan of and Matt best, <laughs> the three of us were at that, that limo barn. When Trevor learned, remember? Yes. <laughs> now, didn't he fly out? Yeah, we were on a turkey hunt with, yeah. like, Mendez. Yeah. That's the place where Chad was wearing the sack over his head, right? <laughs> no, it was a... Um, it was... Where I opened uh, up all the Gardettos? Yeah, but that was... Yeah, yeah, that was... <laughs> actually, if you think back of what Ward had over his head, that was, like, an early version of a COVID uh, mask. Yeah, it was basically a nylon a neck, stocking. Yeah, it was like a neck gaiter that he pulled over. I think it was. I think it was like some kind of a neck gaiter that Traeger was handing out, and then we pulled it all the way over Chad's head so he could like he could see through it. That was hilarious. But yeah, so that was Trevor's first intro because I remember him coming out and like sitting in a blind. Yeah, you opened. This was a big event. It was like it was a big turkey tournament or something, yeah. right? And so... Of the, which I saw zero, but I did have a cow stick its face in the blind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you sent me a picture of that. Uh, you said, I still don't know what a turkey looks like, but what it, this thing is looking in my blind, and it was just this cow, like, inside your turkey blind, just looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember they had bought a bunch of supplies, like a ton of supplies for everybody, and for some reason, you had opened forgot where it was and then opened another one and forgot where that was like three or four bags of costco size costco size gardettas because i remember when you were holding it the bag was like below your waist and the hole was like right here at shoulder level no i know i opened up many because i was hammered (laughs) you were (laughs) you were you had a smile on your face for a while that was awesome so i have a question for you um I love non-archery term people tell me things that they like or that they're going to do for archery, but they kind of make up their own names for stuff. Okay. So if you could, if you could design, let's do five archery targets that had your own name or, 
or like being, what would they be? Because you you said one yesterday. You're like, I want to get a. I forgot what the heck you said. I don't even know what the name. Oh, a dick weasel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're like, I want a dick weasel target. Yeah, I need a turkey. I need a dick weasel. Um, Turkeys exist. I, I, uh, not when I go hunting. Would you do a cigar? <sighs> I would consider it for sure. He need to have a bandana on and a sash. That guy's such a fuck show. <laughs> um, I hate him with a passion. <laughs> I know a few people who have met him, and I'm yet to hear a good story about him. People ask where my hatred comes from. Just spend five minutes on Google. Steven Seagal and, like, I don't know, maybe... Sexual assault, and you'll understand why I hate the person. But back to the targets. So I'd go dick weasel. Turkey already exists. Seagal would definitely be one. <laughs> I don't know what else I would Actually, I'll, I'll allow a turkey because I know you have a serious I hate them. death wish against those. I hate them. They're all over around my house, too. Less now than they used to be, but... <laughs> I was No, I was sleeping one morning, and there's a rock pile by the master bedroom at my house. And a turkey started gobbling at it, and its wing hit the glass sliding door. And then it was, it was the, I had to have been the dumbest Tom ever. It was strutting around a rock pile that doesn't look anything like a turkey to my <laughs> eyes. And it would just, like, posture up and then go get it. And, I mean, I'm not going to tolerate that level of, of abuse and assault at my house, so he got blasted. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe you, but I do believe that you took down a bunch of trees that you knew they were sleeping in. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I did. I cut down I'm like, quite a few. dang, you've trimmed back quite a bit, and you're like, yeah, the freaking turkeys. I'm trying to think of what all the targets that would use. My how, favorite how one is the elk one, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I think if I were to come out with one, an Irish elk would be up. Have you ever seen those? Have you ever seen the Irish elk? Do they actually have that, or is that a mythical creature? No, well, it existed at one time. Does and it still exist? It, it exists in a museum, but it's there was actually an article that came out in a pretty unique magazine about it. Um, I'm going to look for it here because I have never heard of that. They're freaking amazing. It's like an elk. I would say it's like an elk that mixed with a um, with a moose. It would be how I would describe it. A milk? Yep, a milk. Did they just get hunted to extinction? I don't know how the extinction happened. I'm trying to see if I could find this dumb thing. Of course I can't when I need to. Performing anxiety here. No, they're super cool. I mean, obviously if they were endangered or something, I wouldn't go after it. But if you could genetically bring something back, I would certainly bring one of these back before a dinosaur, personally. But I think one of the targets I would do would just look like a door. So Jim Miller could hit it. <laughs> a door target. A door target. He'd feel more comfortable. Dang, I don't know why why I lost that. That's stupid. Yeah, I think a door target could be solid. And then you've got one more. What would be one thing that you think would be a high ticket item at a at a TAC event? An attack event? I mean, I'd probably just go with like a block target, but you could bring your own picture of your ex wife. <laughs> and just shoot at that. All right. Of course, you said one thing that was on the ver. Well, you've kind of treaded down three already. I'm gonna just. I gotta Google it. I had a picture of uh of this really cool article, but so this is like that's what an Irish elk. Whoa! Look at that rack. That's what they look like, and they existed. It looked like. I mean, it obviously looked like something from Lord of the Rings, but tell me that thing wouldn't be just awesome. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. That does look like the paddles of a moose. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Not it that I would know because I've never seen a goddamn moose in the wild, but. Well, you left early. That was your fault. That was my fault, but also Barclay stayed the whole time and never saw one either. So, like, there you go. For everyone looking, that's that's an Irish elk. Versus a human, was that a white tail? Yeah, wow, beast, right? Bigger than a moose. Yeah, and the antlers are like freaking as big, like That's wider than this table. Yeah, I saw it might be as wide as this table per paddle. I saw like a. I don't know if it was the remains. I don't know if it was you know kind of like something they had dug up, but I saw like a full 
skeleton of one in a museum somewhere, and I was like, holy cow. That is that like a dinosaur era animal, though, or is this somewhere uh, in between? Might be in between. That would be awesome. Yeah, I f- actually, I, r- I forget. Um, I forget. I think the reason the antlers were so big, it had nothing to do with, it had to do with, like, their mating, and that was, like, what the female, like, the display was why they would choose who they chose. So that's why they, like, became so big. It wasn't for the purpose of anything thrashing and destroying. Although I bet they could. Oh, yeah. I know what I'd do if I had them. Yeah. Like these two guys behind you. Yep. Step Brothers. What do you think of that? It's good. I lost one of my favorite movies. We're here to interview together. We're here to fuck shit up. <laughs> did Which you is watch, what I would do with those Did paddles. you watch that the first time with me? Me and Sharon? No. No, I've got that one on heavy rotation at the house. Okay. Because I remember we watched a show that you hadn't seen, which I was really surprised by. Like the very first time I came out? No, when we came to Montana for the first time, we sat downstairs and watched a Will Ferrell movie down on the couch. I don't think it was Step Brothers. It was like three or four years ago. Four years ago, maybe? Yeah. I don't know if it was Step Brothers. That one's a classic for sure. Okay, so you're back in the game. Yep. You're, what's on your schedule? What's on your plate for? <clears throat> for hunting season? Yeah. What are you going to get after? Um, what's on your bucket list? I, I said Irish elk, so what's on your bucket list? I mean, if there's any animal I think that I could go hunt, it'd be like northeastern Afghan, like 22 to 24-year-old male. God. You know, preferably with, you know, sack of grenades and maybe a suicide vest on. That'd be sweet. Um <laughs> <laughs> See, I just speak from the heart. No. Um, <laughs> hunting season this year. So, you know, my buddy Nelson He's yeah. actually the guy who got me into jiu-jitsu. He is very dialed into the hunting season in Montana. So I put in for more tags this year than I ever have. So I finally have an antelope tag. I have a couple deer tags. I have my 920 elk tag. Mm-hmm. Um, he put me in for, well, he, he was sat there. First off, I didn't realize the complexity of all this stuff. Like if you don't have a local who has the knowledge, holy cow. Yeah. Because we were on the Montana website and he had all the districts already picked out because there were so many drop down menus that I would have gotten completely lost. I don't know the dis- difference between 270 and District 418W. I'm like, okay. Yeah. So he helped me through that whole process, which took like a half an hour. And then tags just started showing up at the house. So I have a broad swath that I can go after. For lo- for for statewide tags? Statewide. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, a bunch of turkey tags, the deer tags. Uh, I need to put in for a cow tag. I got a buddy who is just so generous with his time, and he's got a range at his house. I want to get a cow for him just for meat for the year because mm-hmm. he wasn't able to get one last year. And it's good because I last year jacked up my arm not too long before hunting season. So yeah. it allowed me, though, to kind of go dive back into the rifle world, and I started working with Christensen Arms. So I'm going to do some rifle hunting I'll probably dedicate my deer tag to rifle because they're going to come out and film a rifle hunt. And then yeah. the elk tag, you and I get to go hunt together again, which will be nice. Yeah. Those are really the, I mean, the elk, if I could only get one tag, I would be super happy just to chase elk around for a little bit. I think one of the the more difficult things isn't people learning archery or getting into archery or bow hunting. I think one of the harder things, especially west of like whitetail country, is knowing all those units in like the time like the zones the zones there's hundreds of when them you in can Montana hunt alone. yeah when you can hunt within those um because there's like some of them you have like first and second season mm-hmm. within a zone and that doesn't necessarily correlate with another spot or multiple tags per season yeah uh, some of Which that allows stuff you is, to do some things but not other for this time period but then it it's, I was so lost in the matrix. I'm still lost. That's why I'm very consistent in where I go because I've, I've really tried to, to like know what I'm, where I'm allowed to hunt and times I'm allowed to hunt and also the different statewide rules in those different areas. So I don't really venture outside of what I've kind of put together in pieces over 30 years. Yeah. Because, you know, if I went to a brand new state, um, which in times where I do this, one of the calls that I make, I'll make 
to like a local game warden in that area and just try to ask them, Hey, what are, what are some common mistakes non-residents or non-locals make that you could help me with? Because sometimes there's always like fine lines yeah, that you just don't know are there. So I want to, I really want to, to try some different stuff. Like I, I've done uh, like goat hunts, billy goat hunts, but I've done them when other people have drawn them and said, hey, I've got a goat tag and such and such. Do you want to go? And I'm more or less – you know, eyes and packing. You know, I'm kind of more of an assister, and yeah, I've, and I've liked you it. You can't touch anything, right? You're just there to help them out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, I'd, I there's still places where they'll say I'm putting in for this and this and this, and I can't not know my schedule too. That's one of the hard things about putting in for these. Some of these tags are you know once in a lifetime or super low success because if you all of a sudden just throw in like, hey, I drew this, you know, sheep tag over here. You know, I might have some might have had something that I've got a deposit on that I've waited two or three years to go to or something like that. Or especially now, like I didn't even draw a general tag for Montana. Which is the first time ever, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and I know a lot of people that did not. And so that's a reflection of Bow hunting's growing, yeah. you know, archery's growing. However, it's also a reflection that, you know, it's going to get difficult for people like me who have just always had these routines. We're going to, you know, we're going to have to play more. We're going to have to put more names and hats, you know. to <laughs> Getting squeezed. Yeah, yeah. To like, to be able to still have the same amount of options, it's almost like you're going to have to, put in for more and one of the things that maybe makes this a little bit difficult is there's a lot of there's a lot of companies right now that put in for people and so they'll just get people's information and they'll say like what do you want to hunt well I'd love to hunt a, a elk this year do you really care what state they're no. like a hunting concierge basically oh yeah mhm i didn't even know that existed yeah mine just is nelson yeah he's probably one there there are people like nelson and honestly, um, he's not doing that for everybody though. Like I'm just good homies with Nelson. So he sat me down. Well, like Jared from hunt and fool actually worked with Jared for probably 20 years when he was a trophy taker and Jared, he was always that person that I would call anyway and say like, Hey dude, you know, I really would like to hunt Idaho or Montana, but I've got, like, I have to be in New Mexico for the first two weeks. I need to be like, which, what's my best option for trying to hunt after October 1st? And he would just say, oh, you know, put in for this. A lot of people don't really utilize it because it's so late in the season, yep. but you know, it's, it's underrated. And so there's, there's like companies out there that do that same thing to where they'll just ask the person how, you know, how many tags do you want us to put in for? what's the states that you prefer? And they may say like, you know, I only want these states or it doesn't matter. You know, there's some people that just say, put me in for freaking everything. And at the end, at the end of the year, they call and say like, Oh, by the way, you got an antelope in Colorado. You got a mule deer in Montana for, you know, second season or whatever. And they, they just go through the list and then you have to juggle the schedule. But I just I feel like that tallies really quickly in the old checkbook. Oh yeah, but there's definitely people that the checkbook doesn't matter. Yeah, that that doesn't matter. I think all of my Montana tags this year were two hundred and some dollars. It's the first year I hunted in Montana was on a non-resident tag, and the combined elk and deer was just over a grand. I've stopped looking. I think it's twelve now or more. It's going up for a resident though. Oh my god, it's nice. Well, I, I like, think it was less than three hundred bucks for all the tags I put in for. Iowa's nice for a resident. Because I get a lot of tags and they're not that much. Yeah, you take a picture every year, it's like nine feet of tags. Yeah, it's like nine feet of tags and it's <laughs> somewhere around, you know, 150 bucks or whatever. I'll get nine feet of tags. But obviously, uh, Iowa is pretty tough to, to draw. But some of the whitetail states, it's so simple for people to get into bow hunting because you go and you'll buy a, you know, a non resident whitetail tag and then normally a non-resident hunting license and you're good to go. And it'll say right on there, you know, whitetail season is October 1st to yeah. December 19th or whatever. And, th and then it's easy, but, and I don't think there's whitetail 
Well, no, there are white tail like uh, Kansas has zones, which was always you know you had to pick like first choice or second choice. And sometimes I'd put a second choice in, not because I want it, and then I ended up getting it. And then you're like, okay, where the heck <laughs> can I hunt in this zone? <laughs> yeah. No, it's nice to have the local. But yeah, but so for this year, I have all those set up. I'm going to do, like I said, a rifle hunt uh, for Chris uh, Christensen, which has been cool to get back behind long guns and rifles. I was wondering how you felt about it. It's nice. I enjoy it. Yeah. Um, specifically long range marksmanship. And by that, I don't mean a couple hundred yards. I mean, you're coming up on, you know, four digit numbers. Like that's truly long range. It becomes yeah. much more of an art form than a science. Yep. Uh, and it's cool to tinker with it because the tolerances are so fine. You know, talking about a quarter of a minute of angle or fact, you know, the, the biggest one is the wind. Like that's probably one of the biggest differences between archery hunting, in my opinion, and rifle hunting. Wind for archery, meaning they can smell you. Like the, I'm not yeah. incredibly worried about, I mean, obviously if it's like a gale force wind. I probably wouldn't be out there with my bow anyway, but it can have an impact, but the wind on the ballistics of a long rifle is just unbelievable at those distances. Yeah. And you have to factor that stuff and you can read books about calling wind, but you know, good luck reading a book and then trying to dial your scope in and look at the mirage. And then you see it going four different directions in the flight of a bullet. You just gotta, you gotta spend time behind the scope. So yep. that stuff has been fun. Uh, so I have my tags that I'll feel. And then, but like just for my hurting myself last year, allowing myself to get hurt. I don't know how to describe it. It was kind of my own fault. It was 62% my fault and 50% the fault of the person I was rolling with. That's how I do math. That was my fault. I should have tapped. Um, but it forced me, I knew I wasn't going to be able to bow hunt. I literally couldn't even, I couldn't even pick my bow up and push it out. Like I said, I tried to draw it back one time and my elbow just bent. I was like, okay, we're going to put this on the shelf for <laughs> a little bit. Um, it gave me the chance to uh, try to get Leah in the game. Yeah. So my whole goal last season was to get Leah a deer, which we did on yeah. the first day directly across the lake from my house. So you can see where it is. Oh, that's awesome. <clears throat> yeah. So, and again, that the benefit of that was getting linked up with Christensen. They sent me a 308 and I had a suppressor to put on it, which just changes the game for people rifle hunting, mm -hmm. not only for the shooting experience, but when you miss, which you're going to miss, you know, all the, you know, Carlos Hathcocks in the world, like I never miss, I'm like, shut up. When you miss the animal and be like, hmm, what was that? I guess I'll just go back to eating. <laughs> As opposed to an unsuppressed 300 win bag, boom, and then everything within an eight-mile radius is at full speed within a half second. 300 win mags your favorite caliber, right? For larger stuff. I shot uh, I shot a deer last year as well with the same rifle. 308 is perfect for you know deer inside a couple hundred yards. I mean, the thing fell directly over. It's got great kinetic, kinetic energy. But for elk or anything bigger, you, you need a bigger bigger round in my opinion i know you can kill elk with a 308 but if you're going to get four or five six seven eight hundred yards I'd, I'd go with the bigger round did you you carried a 300 win mag didn't you i did when yeah it worked was, yeah i think it's an absolute scalpel is that what else did you carry how uh, how much would your how much would your your carries vary too not that much uh you know pre-911 it was you know we were training with like mp5 which is ridiculous it's a pistol caliber you know what is it? It's some machine gun, probably. Uh, and then switched over to the M4 platform, which is 556 or 223. Um, and then I'd say around 2006, 2007, we realized we needed to be able to uh, have a better range than the 762. Mm -hmm. Most of the Eastern Bloc 762 by 39 rounds, you know, they have a, a much longer effective range than 556. So they started looking at like HK 416s and I think it's HK 4 I forget what the 762 version of that is but a gas, you know, a piston AR platform. They look almost identical. Then they started playing with 300 blackout. Then they started for a while in the conventional teams they started fielding the uh Mark 17s, the Scar heavies, which is a 762 round as well. Yeah. So I had to carry a Scar on my last deployment in 2010. I was not a fan of it. The first gunfight we got into, I fired one round and it jammed. I was like fuck my life <laughs> and then it was just like one shot from there on out for the rest of the day and i it, i just found i had to clean it to a level that i didn't want to have to clean and yeah. but it's moon dust at the same time so it's i don't know if anything's really tuned for that but then just that bolt action 300 oh. win mag is just game time do they like depending on your your loadout choice like do you have seniority on loadout choice and depending on what you're taking they'll put other people in there that have weapons that you know to what like 
In other words, mm. not everyone can go like, I'm bringing the sniper rifle. Well, not everybody's a sniper. You're only going to have... Ex so, from the perspective of, call it a conventional SEAL team, and we'll just use the math of 16 people, because then you can cut the cut it into half and have you know two elements of eight that are mutually supporting, or you can cut those even deeper, and two elements of four. You'll probably have two snipers per element of eight. And you're only going to get so many sniper suites, the guns that you get issued. Yeah. Per Because there's just specifically at the conventional teams, you're very, you're not very constrained. You're more constrained by budget than you are at other commands. Yeah. Where again, though, unless you go to sniper school and are sniper qualified, you can't just go into an armory and be like, today it will be a 300 win back. It's like, no, you can probably, you could carry, I think in 2010, you could carry the five, five, six version of the scar or the seven, six, two version. You could carry a slightly shorter barrel or a longer barrel, but I mean, that was it. They're not, there's not a buffet fingerprint safe and then it just door opens and like before every operation you go in and pick whatever you want. It's the exact opposite of that. You get issued guns that are serialized and then you're, that's going to be your gun platform for the next 18 or 24 months. Okay. Except for at places at like the East Coast Command where you have a lot more flexibility where I know guys who are rotating back and forth between like MP7s, HK416s, uh, you know, I mean, I guess if they wanted to, they could go with a belt fed, you know. But again, the, once you start getting outside of like the, not a basic platform, but a standard AR type platform, like you need some additional training. Like not yeah. everybody can shoot a sniper rifle. Not everybody should be carrying a SAR or 240 or any of that stuff. You need to be specialists on, on those things. And you're going to, again, if you look at the unit size that you're going to go with, you need to have mutually supporting positions. So it's like, we'll take two of these and two of these. And then we need a comm guy. We need a medic dude. And, you know, so you... Not everybody can carry everything. Yeah. So you have to go to the school, specifically for sniper school. So you you carried a 300 Win Mag and a Javelin. A Javelin launcher, the clue, the command launching unit, and then two missiles, yeah. <laughs> I made, I fashioned a backpack. It was like uh, the Toy Story where the little thing would pop out. It basically I had two missile tubes, and then I'd put the clue on top of that, and, and then the 300 Win Mag, <laughs> and not walk very fast <laughs> at all. And sometimes I would make other people carry the missiles, <laughs> but not, I wouldn't let them shoot them, obviously. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I kind of envision if there was no rules anywhere that I would have seen that load out. I played by the rules. I just was the only person who was qualified to actually shoot that weapon system. And then we were in a place where, you know, by 2010, they had That's where tech door comes in, but I could tell you probably like looked at like, wait a minute. If I want to shoot one of those, I need to be the only one that knows how to learn this. I stuff. had already gone to the school years before, and it was, and I don't even know why I was sent to that school. And we were over in Afghanistan, and we had done a turnover, and I was looking in the Connex box with the stuff that we had turned over. And I was like, son of a bitch, those are javelin tubes <laughs> that had never been fired because it's an anti tank weapon. And then I went on a mission to find, because we had the tubes, but not the launcher. So we had the missiles, but not the relatively complicated system that you have to hook the two up. It's connected by a lithium, a, like a liquid gas lithium battery that you charge. And then eventually you're looking through the warhead yeah. because it's a fire and forget heat seeking missile. It's fucking awesome. <laughs> and, uh, I didn't have a launcher. So I had, I went on a, a mission, not like an operation, but a personal mission to find one of those, which I did at a green beret ODA who traded me for a half shell helmet One's worth about 50 grand. The other one's worth about 400 bucks. We did a straight <laughs> up trade. Um, he put it on a convoy that was coming out. And then, uh, yeah, I hooked the sucker up. And I mean, nobody else knew how to fire it. <laughs> and we'd be sitting out there and these guys, you know. Uh, so I. So when was the day where all of a sudden you're just like, hold on a minute. <laughs> not long after I got the launcher. Um, because uh, a PKM is a, it's a machine gun. And it's basically a belt fed 300 win mag. It's the, and so you that can sit vicious. back. It is vicious, but they can sit back at 1500, 2000 yards and just lob in 300 win mag rounds. And you imagine how shitty that is. <laughs> and you have this little pea shooter. It's like going to a, somebody shooting a catapult at you and you're shooting back a rubber band. <laughs> like, well, this is awesome. I need to find a rock to hide behind. So I think probably a week after I got the launcher, we were out and we were being reported on. There was a dude on a hilltop, like two, probably like 2,000 yards away. And we could, 
they have ICOM radios, so like a little walkie talkies. And we had mm-hmm. the ability to listen to them. And through the interpreters, we could see what they're saying, or see what they're saying, hear what they're saying. And uh, he was coordinating an attack and maneuvering people on. So he could see, I was up in a high ground position. He could see the elements that were in the low ground position. He was maneuvering people to attack the low ground position, which meets the ROE of hostile act or hostile intent. Yeah. So he's trying to maneuver people and. He was the eyes in the sky. He was the eyes in the sky for sure. And clearly and describing the, like the low ground positions and what the people are wearing, like, okay, we're probably talking about the same people. Also, yeah. this is a line of sight radio system. And he was on the top of the hill, but so far away from any of the other weapon systems, like 301 mags, not going to go. I mean, you can try to shoot somebody at 2000 yards. You'd need it probably like a 50 cal, but you're going to miss the first yard. They're probably going to go on the other side of the hill and forget about it. Yeah. So I hooked that sucker up and I didn't know. What'd they- you tell people? You're like, Hey, by the way, like you can hang around and watch this or not. Like, Nobody really knew what to expect. <laughs> they had never seen one go off because it spits out of the tube, and then the and then the uh, Rocket, missile actually yeah, kicks, kicks in, in and in. takes off. And there's two ways you can do it. You can do a straight on attack or direct attack where it kind of arcs in, or you can do a top attack because they're designed for tanks, and tanks don't have armor on the top because yeah. why would they? So it'll go out and then pretty much does an eagle pounce. Yeah, it goes straight up and comes in and comes down. And I played with both. They're both pretty awesome. <laughs> um, but I remember I, I had it on top attack, and this guy was just sitting on the top of the mountain, and I didn't know if it was going to have the heat signature to be able to lock onto. Because you only have about 60 seconds once you actually charge the tube. You're looking through the launching unit, and that has a, a thermal in it, but you have to eventually flip over to the warhead. So you pull a trigger, it makes this really weird, like, <laughs> like as all the gas charges. <laughs> And then the warhead comes up, and then you start looking through the sensor, and you narrow down these brackets. And if you can get the brackets on what it is you want to hit, and you pull one of the triggers, it'll, like, flash this little uh, crosshair, and then it locks. If that sucker's on what you want it to be, <laughs> pull that other trigger. <laughs> and then it just goes, Doof, and it spits out, and it takes off. And people are just like, what the fuck? <laughs> and then, you know, I obviously immediately put it down and just pull my binos up. And it takes longer than you'd think it would, especially with the top attack. And people are watching. They're like, well, that thing's stupid. And then the entire top of the mountain vaporized. And they're just like, oh, my God. <laughs> it's amazing. And it cha- I mean, it changed for us. It it pushed people way out. Yeah. So there was people who tried to hide behind rocks. Uh, yeah, they just thought they were safe because they had had years of knowing the effective range of most of the, the weapon systems. And then when you have air assets that come overhead, they just va- they leave because yeah. they know what that sounds like. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I was able to shoot that thing almost out to, like, 4,000 yards. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah, they should name that thing the Stumpy because... I think I shot, like, 12 of those things. That had your name all over it. Oh, it did. Yeah, I, th- I think I shot, like, 12 of those tubes. It was awesome. What are they around? I forgot. Just over 100 grand. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> That's awesome. How, what do you think is going to be the biggest takeaway for everybody else that came and got lessons so far? I would say what's already smacking them right in the face is the knowledge that it is more intricate and complicated than they think. Mm -hmm. Like this, pull this back, line up the sites and the way you're teaching, right? You, I was, what was it making? Yeah. Last night we're sitting in uh, talking with Denver. I'm like, yeah, don't worry. And a year of deadly, will tell you something that you're doing now that he doesn't want to, waste your time with because it'll just unwind you it'll melt your face off (laughs) yeah so i mean all of them like leah's taking notes and trying to remember all this stuff it's hard to describe how many things you can potentially think about as you're pulling back that bow all of those things you can completely mess up so i think they're getting an understanding of oh this is a little bit harder than just let's rip this cable back and then let it fly yeah that's what sucks about any sport that's like like you jumping in a wind tunnel right away i'm like oh okay you know he told me like you know hey put your feet out you're gonna go forward yep. you know if your feet lift up you're gonna slide back you know so you pretty much just said like you know push away conceptually very know. easy yeah <laughs> and then you get in there and just oh and by the way completely relax as well so it's not that hard <laughs> which is the opposite of what anybody does in the wind tunnel yeah and then you get in there and just realize yeah I'm a complete idiot bouncing around off this freaking shell glass trying to figure it out. Yeah. I think the more simple it looks from the outside, oftentimes the more complex it is to actually master. 
Yeah. So I think that's what they're... Do you ever find on the second day there's a little degradation in performance because now they're thinking about a ton of stuff? Well, there's always serious progression in something. Normally, it's the thing that they struggled with the first day because they go and they start thinking about it. And it seems like right out of the gate, everybody does like better because they thought about a lot of stuff, but they hadn't done it mechanically. So they had kind of visualized, I think. People are like, yeah, I've thought so much about it. And then they'll they'll do good right away, but then something else will pop up now to where they let go of something they should be thinking about and another thing comes in. And then once you have to start addressing that, then it's like the wheels will come off kind of towards the end of that second day. I think I shot my bow for five months before realizing there was a level bubble in there. A level <laughs> bubble or a bubble level? Same thing. Okay. Leveling the bubble. <laughs> that'll that'll get Denver a little bit. Did did we not talk about that? No, you did. Oh, that's right. But I, I you was came like, here and I, maybe I watched you and just told you about it. I think I knew it was there. Like I was physically aware that it, the bubble was there. I don't think I paid any attention to it. Yeah. I was focusing on other stuff. And then I was having like left and rights. You're like, how's the bubble doing? I'm like, oh, oh, I have to look at that too. Okay. <laughs> What's the one thing that you feel like You've seen me work with a lot of people. Is there one thing where you feel like they always ask you the same thing um, at the end of the night? Or is there one thing that you, like, what's the one little piece of advice you give them? The most common thing that people will say after their first day is, how in the hell do you hunt with this thing? (laughs) Like, this is hard enough to stand in front of a target at 10 yards and remember all this. How do you kill an animal with this? Which it's like, hey, pack a lunch. That's a journey for sure. Yeah. Uh, that that actually is, if they are interested in starting because they want to hunt, I think that most people believe that's a very short journey. Like, I have a bow now. I can just go kill an animal. It's like, can you now? Yeah. <laughs> can you? <laughs> Wait until an elk comes running at your face, bugling. And, oh, by the way, you're behind the power curve. You haven't ranged anything near you. You don't have an arrow knocked at all. And you have about seven seconds to get into your shooting position. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there you definitely get trial by fire. Yeah, once you go on your your first hunt, and it, it seems like it's impossible to to simulate that f- feeling people get the first time they actually encounter an, an an animal, and then make the decision of, okay, you're up, like get an arrow going, this sucker's coming, it's go time, and then you just see this like, wait, what? Well. Statically, their shot process right now or sequence is like over a minute. Yeah. It's like, cool, you need to pack that into four seconds. <laughs> you need to be ready to shoot in four seconds. <laughs> Not easy. Yeah, and that's why practice is so important because you just have to, like, you have to ingrain it so much to where you can be somewhat robotic in your, in like those motor skills that happen. Yeah. You know, the number one question I think I get is, how steady is your pin on the target? Yeah. How, because they it's, I mean, you've been describing it for years. It's not steady. Mm-hmm. And it's very hard to describe. Like, yeah, it's all over the place. Sometimes it's on the target. Sometimes it's not. And they're like, how do you do that though? I'm like, you just shoot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yesterday we were shooting in the wind and I was trying to get marks uh, for Denver's bow to put a scale on there, which I should have never done. I, as soon as he came out, came outside, I'm like, uh, this is big boy area. This me and Andy are out here. Go back inside. But he was just kind of like holding his bow out, like with like his bow and his arrows, like give me sight marks. <laughs> yeah. He was Cause I that. said like, are you just going to shoot 20 out here or something? He's like, well, once or twice. <laughs> It, yeah, but he learned. I think I think he learned the hard way why I didn't want to do that yet. I get why he wanted to. Yeah, I, mean, I do too. Yeah, but yeah, your pin is <sighs> is blowing all around, and if you rush into that, it's not a good thing because you're trying to just you're trying to just like trust the fact that you have some movement, which is why I keep targets really big and people are really close when I'm teaching. Is I'm like, okay, honestly, what their pin is probably doing out of the gate on that big target at 10 yards, that's probably about like what mine's looking like, I would say, at 100. Yeah. You think? That I figure mean, eight. 
yeah, just like moving all around and, you know, and you're trying to pull through. Um, but yeah, as soon as you start to go on smaller dots, obviously it make, it gives the appearance your movement is greater, which I think leads to target panic. If you're not ready for it, I think it's the most important thing for people to have to embrace is that you're not you and your bow or your sight pin are not going to be locked in a vice. They are going to be moving around. Which is true of a uh, rifle pistol as well. This perfect sight picture, it's why I try to teach people on iron sights on pistols before they put on a red dot like an RMR, ruggedized miniature reflex, I think that's what it stands for. But any type of red dot, because they will see the dot on where they want it to hit, and they'll go, now! And it's like you just you just shot about eight inches low into the left because <laughs> you drove that gun it's tough. And then you teach them on iron sights. You can teach them that surprise. It's all the same stuff. Like the rear side alignment, the front side alignment, allow it to surprise you when it goes off. Not meaning like, oh my God, my gunfire, but you didn't know exactly when it was going to break. Do they do that? Are they more likely to try to teach someone with iron sights so that they're not seeing the magnification of all the movement and darting around or? Well, when you're teaching iron sights specifically on a pistol, you're staring at your front sight. So the target behind you is blurry but your front sight is clear if i switch you to a red dot sight oftentimes people they can stare right at the target and still see the red dot yeah and it they i see it you can see them because they'll like lock into place because that red dot is right there for a moment and they smash the gun and just miss <laughs> whereas you have to let it you have to just let it float around and more importantly you just have to keep continuous and consistent back pressure to the rear on the pistol like it sh you shouldn't know exactly when it's going to go off I was surprised at, um, like, your your effective distance um, on your M4 platforms. And I'm just basing this off Jocko telling me we were, you know, we were shooting archery on in Big Sky, and then someone was, like, on the far side coming down this thing, and he was just, he was talking about, like, how if it, you know, if, if a couple team guys – had ARs, like, none of that stuff that we could even see would be a be an issue. He's like, yeah, that, like, we could take out all those targets, not a problem. And I was like, really? You, like, with an M4, you like, you wouldn't worry about that? He's just like, no, dude. How far away was it? I'm guessing 250. Yeah, I'd say anything within 300. I mean, be all right. yeah, it was 250, and I was thinking, like, I could, I know I could, you know, if I cracked off a couple rounds i would hit it but i like don't know if i'd be effective but maybe that's what he's talking about no i mean depending on the optics you'd, yeah you would want probably i wouldn't take an iron sight shot on an m4 250 uh but i mean there's there's all sorts of uh, optics guys have most people are gonna have like a four power or an eotech with a three to four power magnifier like with there. a flip over yeah i mean yeah. you'd be fine with that yeah yeah i was surprised i was like oh okay dang he's like yeah dude that would be like those targets would just be eliminated. Wouldn't even be an issue. Be yep. non-factor. Well, especially when there's ten people shooting at him, <laughs> somebody's gonna get lucky. So, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I'm pumped that uh, that Leah's in. She's. I want to do a podcast with her after, you know, maybe after we talk, do a review and everything. Because yep. I know she's, you know, she stopped just to buy a notebook. Correct. Like I said, her jujitsu journey is, she probably won't tell you about it, but I think she got her black belt in s somewhere between the seven to eight year mark, which is, in my understanding, accelerated. Mm -hmm. I don't pay too much attention to the time that it takes people, nor do I think it's a good idea for people to pay attention to that. Yeah. Personal opinion, I'm not a professional at it by any stretch. And then she competed at a super high level. I mean, to, uh, she didn't compete last year, but the year before that, she was the uh, world champ at her belt and age yeah. and uh, weight bracket. Yeah. So she smashes people in the gym. It's awesome. I was trying to tell Harry that last night because they were having a conversation. I'm like, dude, she's a badass. She's yep. legit. And I, like, started to tell him, and he just, like, stopped me. He's like, she can tell me, bro. You don't have to tell me everything <laughs> about everybody. And I just said, well, I'm telling you because she's probably not going to tell yeah. you. And he's just like, yeah, let her tell her story. So I was just like, okay. I'll but she's got up. a couple master's degrees. She was she worked in Alaska um, for the, uh, I think it was the Forest Service, or the Park Service. She was a snowboard instructor. Oh, um, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's awesome. Diverse background. She won't, probably won't tell you any of it. 
I'll try to dig it out. Yep. So will she? Can she out shred you on the mountain? I can go faster than her, which is all that matters. Because <laughs> I weigh more. I love our first snowboarding trip. Of course, I got like I think two trips down where I learned to scoot and scrape, yep. scoot and scrape, scoot and scrape. You know, luckily JP helped like dedicated that time to teaching me and yep. then once because the first time we literally came out of the little tree house that we rented yep. and we and i kind of scraped down to the bottom and then we took a little lift up to the top of that particular little hill yeah. and scraped scraped and yep jived and then you just said we're going to take this ski lift over here for this next one yep. which black diamonds went to the top Goddamn right. <laughs> you <can> fine. <laughs> then you're like, all right, just do that. Fast or not. We need to get you out there for like a week where we can be consistent. Like you guys came out when you guys surprised me. The weather was just shit. It was yeah, like it was raining. Horrible. It was we would we would have been on ice, which you would have never gone snowboarding again. Yeah, that yeah. I or used to have broken, to ski on ice yeah. most of the time. Or you would have broken everything from your like your knees up. <laughs> it's just the worst. Yeah, wrists. My wrist, I broke them. I broke my wrist so much like skateboarding and I think I might have broke my wrist. I, I think I broke my wrist skiing a few times and it was never really a problem until I would say the last, it might've just been the winter. It was overly cold. And so my gym, like the heat in there isn't, it's not like awesome hot. <laughs> it's just enough to where, you know, the, like the iron's cold and, you know, you can hold it long enough to do some sets, but, you know, it is, there's definitely chill in the iron, but starting this winter, my wrists just started hurting, you know, more to where they're, they're tight and they click a lot. So I think all that, those old breaks are starting to catch up. Jiu-Jitsu is highlighting some uh, mileage on my body as well. <laughs> some joint and tendon, like mm, getting old. <laughs> Plus, you're getting gray. Yeah, I've been gray like the whole time. So what's one thing we haven't done together that we need to? Talk, we've had some journeys. Yeah, we've had some awesome ones. Yep. Um, what else could we do? Because on my phone, you know, it recognizes people's face. So when I made that post yesterday about you, I just kind of clicked on your face to see. And I was just, I was like, oh, dang, I forgot yeah. about that. I forgot about that. I, I mean, we've. Gone to other countries and bow hunted. We've jumped out of some planes, the wind tunnel stuff. We've done tack stuff, done stuff down there with Black Rifle with Evan and Matt. I mean, hog hunts. I didn't hog like. I'd forgot we took Evan on this on this bow hunting hog hunt. I was right behind him when he pulled back for the first time, just trying to unwind him mentally. Like, don't <laughs> I've got mess that. This I've, up. <laughs> I've got that on camera. <laughs> just shaking like it's a sheet in the wind. I don't know. What else would you want to do? I mean, we'd have to, if, we, if you want to jump some more, we just need to get you current. Yeah. I'm not even current right now. I haven't been able to travel and, uh, and go jump, but yeah, I think I'd like to do that again for sure. Maybe a cool snowboarding trip would be a good one to go on. We got to get a little bit more mileage under you. Yeah. But I mean, those can, cause you can go to some really cool places that are remote and base it out of like, a, you know, a cat skiing operation where they just take like you up, up where Evan is that, that, yeah. that looked super legit. Oh, when we took the heli? Yeah. yeah. He hooked us up with like the locals discount. Uh, me, Trevor, and Nelson flipped there. That was awesome. Just to have the helicopter just dropping you off. And it was like a couple hundred bucks per guy. I mean. Yeah, that was that was awesome. But you won't have the skill level for that. Otherwise, it, would be, it wouldn't be enjoyable because if you fall in that and you're like up to your armpits and powder trying to get back on your board, it's not the jam. Maybe I'd be able to stand up. Kind of like... <laughs> When I was killing myself trying to paddle out surfing and then got nuked a few times by waves and then finally, like, just put my feet down. And I'm like, oh, I'm just in the coral here. I can just walk. I don't think there's coral in San Diego, but <laughs> where you were surfing. <laughs> but Whatever. Just rocks. Yeah, it was probably rocks. I don't know. I don't uh, – I'm not going to come to a screeching halt in my grave and not have a lot of things that I wanted to do that I didn't do. Yeah, you've your bucket list is – Way, way shorter than mine. I don't Fly know what else planes, I put on it. Yep. Launch javelins. I mean, played with all kinds of cool toys. Yep. Went pretty deep down the base jumping rabbit hole for a couple of years. Yeah. Well, and you had awesome funds to train you and, you know, on yep. the whole jumping side of things for forever. What's on your bucket list? 
Mm, I don't really know. I mean, I, w- I actually would really like to, um, I'd like to take more time to like be in a beach life. Honestly, I would love to, like, I would love to be able to dedicate more time to surf. I would like to be able to dedicate, like, I almost want to have a year or something where I can try a lot of different things to see something that could potentially be a new hobby. Mm -hmm. Like there's small little things like I'd, I'd love to, um, and one of them I'm actually going to do, um, I'm, I'm going to go and learn this, uh, mountain primal has a really awesome, um, meat processing like process. Mm. So I'm going to go and actually learn, um, and it's something I'm going to bring. Like bring on a to, cow? Um, it'll be on, on a top? buffalo. Okay. Yeah. It'll be on a buffalo. And then also um, some of their stuff, like they do have um, farm-raised elk as well that people buy, you know, but it has to be like properly raised and stuff. But still. What do people to, do with them when they buy them? Well, you can buy like elk meat like to your house. So like there has to be, you know, it's like a buffalo ranch or whatever. They have to have. I they have they to go were. by standards. You know, it's not like I've only ever broke down an elk when it's out in the mud and crud. Yeah. You know, so I would love to be able to slow things down, you know, and, and just do it like super meticulous. And we were able to do it pretty meticulous for your bull. Um, but it was like, it was also nice. There were four of us. Yeah. So having bark. Makes quick work. Yeah. So for me to be able to take a lot of time on the caping and then be able to debone everything and then just hand it off to where you guys were bagging and tagging more or less was really nice. But I've always really wanted to learn processing in a very controlled environment to where I could ask questions and have someone that was kind of a master at that. So we're talking like stainless steel type processing and full on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's different for sure. That's kind of been on my bucket list um, to learn that stuff. And another thing on my bucket list is uh, I always thought it'd be cool if if you had the time to just work in several different trades just long enough to get proper training. Like, I would love to, and maybe this will happen in the future, I would love to, like, take a week to get trained to be, like, a barista. Because... Come out to the coffee shop. Yeah, exactly. Because I can make coffee. and I feel like I make good coffee um, for me, but I'd also like to be able to make some, like, designer stuff. I don't, well, we would have to talk to Evan. Just because you're like a barista, I don't think necessarily means you, you probably means you could consumer face and create coffee, the limited offerings on that menu. Yeah. You're talking like an artisan level coffee dude who. Yeah, you can like make leaves and shit on the top of your coffee foam, like with designs. Like I want to learn how to do that stuff. Whenever I try to like do something with the foam, it just. Yeah. It just looks like a bunch of lung matter came out on top of my coffee. Fortunately, we know the right people for that particular bucket yeah. list item. Yeah, I don't have anything where I'd go and just say, you know, I really wish I would have done this. Yeah. And I think... I, I just think, go do it. Yeah, I think for people that travel too, that travel a lot, they realize that a lot of the world is so similar to what's here, just in a, you know, depending on your... It seems like depending on the height that you're at, you know, the further north you are looks like this. And as it comes south, it looks like this, 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 and this. And like, you know, when we go to France, I'm like, well, this just, this looks just like blah, blah, blah. Or if we certain parts of England, you know, this looks just like this, or you go to the black forest in Germany, you're like, well, this is just like the Northwest. Yes. A lot of similarities. So I think once you've got a little bit of that travel under your belt, there isn't a whole lot. Spear fishing is one of the things. I'd like to, you know, hard kind of learn, learn breath control. You're a hard pass. Yeah, I'm not interested in the beach or the water. Well, I know why, but go. To, do you know Healy? I mean, he's the guy to learn spear fishing. Yeah, from. I went axis deer hunting with him in uh, Lanai. He's awesome. Yeah, Mark's supposed to. Mark wants to do a bow build, so yeah, he's one of the ones that's going to be that's going to be coming a little late to that. But yeah, he's he's super cool. I mean, all those guys, honestly, Shane. Like Shane Dorian, super cool Healy, um, and you know Alex down there on the island on Lanai, he um, he's a spear fisher too. You talking about the guide? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. 
I really like him. He's he's super. super I think that's stuck. who I was with for a long time as well. Yeah, he's he's. I think the only person that I know that's shorter than Bridges. Yeah, I haven't had need to see a side by side comparison of that. He's me. pretty jacked too, dude. I don't know if yeah. I mean, like, Bridges though couldn't see over this table. His life depended on it. So, <laughs> well, he's kind of getting. He got bit by the bug. Bridges did. Yeah, he went on a whitetail hunt. He was like texting me from his whitetail hunt that he did. I think he was in Missouri. How'd it go for him? I'm sure he got one. It's horrible that I don't remember, but I do think that he, yeah, I th- I'm sure he got one. He was pretty dang pumped. But now he's getting into boxing? I don't know. I think he's got a boxing match in October. Oh, yeah, they're doing a, I think it's a fundraiser. Why not? Everybody's getting into boxing. Just the YouTube dude or whatever. You're like, Cool. We're all boxers now. It's great. Everybody should box. Now, I want to do a dual sport uh, motorcycle ride, like a long one. What do you mean dual sport? So they can go on-road and off-road. Oh, okay. Like an enduro, you're saying? Yeah. I don't know the difference. I know there are dual sport bikes and enduros. I don't know enough about it, but I like the idea of being self-sustaining on a motorcycle. Uh, Like about where I live, there's thousands of miles of logging trails just to go out and just be able to get lost in the woods for a couple of days or go from A to B. I just like that. I've traveled probably two, three lifetimes worth. Now it's like, okay, well, how can I get A to B more interesting? More yeah. B, and so yeah. where I live, I have the ability to do it. So that's the kind of stuff that interests me more. Certain areas you're allowed to have a dirt bike mm-hmm. and certain ones you're not. I think, I don't, I think the main thing is like, if you're allowed to go on both, it has to do with the lights that are on it more so than the motorcycle, right? Headlamp, tail light, turn lights. Turn signals, stuff like that, yeah. It's got to be road legal, and then I don't know what's required on the actual. Yeah, uh, there's dirt, so. there's definitely spots where you're allowed, like, single track, and then there's, you know, like, single track meaning, you know, bikes. Yeah. Because I did, um, I actually did um, uh, a goat hunt off dirt bikes. Really? Yeah, tw- like, 12,000 feet or something and then did you're gonna a, want a dirt bike for that for sure and then did uh and then did uh and it was cool like it was all single track i mean there's like sketchy stuff and then did a elk hunt too off dirt bikes like could every, you ride them i'm wondering could you ride them and hunt the same day because then there sometimes there's time requirements yeah. like if you're in a plane you gotta have 24 hours on the ground yeah there's definitely spotting re- yeah there's definitely requirements from like for that um, some of the requirements I think on motorized vehicles is more like you can't like in some places you can't ride them before noon, you know, like you can't just yeah. be ripping out in the morning. And I'm pretty sure Alberta is that way. I don't think you can ride the four wheeler before a certain time. You either have to be in one hour before light or something like that. Or there's a block of time where you cannot use Yeah. It. Like once it cracks light, you can't be on your ATV until noon something like that, which is a pretty good idea. But I like that, yeah. But with the dirt bike, um, I don't know. But, I mean, it was also a long – it was kind of ahead of its time. Like So the first DVD that I did with Darren, D&D bow hunting, we had multiple dirt bike hunts in that. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd have to check the regs on that in Montana. But I just like the idea of you can – get the bags on the bike, throw a GPS on there and just go get lost. Like to me, that's so much more interesting than, I don't know, just about anything else at this point. Yeah. Cause I love, I love a, I love a mountain bike, but they're not, um, there's just, you have limitations yeah. on, on that mountain bike. The mountain bikes were awesome up in BC. Like once you have kind of a pop-up area and, and if you have the ability to charge in that pop-up area. Yeah, the pedal then, assist ones, those things are mine. Yeah, then then you're good. Um, but they also have limitations like once you have to cross a little bit more of a stream or something, or if you or if you like have mud that's deeper than a yeah. than a certain depth and that like that crap gets in your, you know, in your freaking your shifting cogs, then you're just or your whatever that little like tension wheel is. Yeah. It's like once you get that thing boogered up, then it's problematic. Agreed. All right, dude. Let's go freaking crush some breakfast. And then it's archery day two. Yeah, I'm gonna let you teach. I'm gonna try to entice Denver to take shots he's not qualified for. And like then, it's a turkey. It's just 70 yards. Just let the pin float all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that's one thing that we haven't talked about in our adventures 
that I had some, uh, some history with on my phone is how many people thought they could run with the big dogs and got nuked in our wake of everybody of, uh, <laughs> of party skills, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> yeah. There'll be someone out there that that'll, I'm sure is a true professional at it, but you know, we've, we definitely haven't left too much behind. No, we've had a good time in many different places. <laughs> yeah. All right, dude. Cool, man. Well, thanks for being the first one in the video podcast area. This well, now awesome. I have to upgrade my goddamn podcast studio. This is bullshit. Yep. That's the thing. We're good at one up in each other. So we might as well just keep leapfrogging. So fair enough. All right. See cool. you, everybody. Be sure to check out knockonarchery.com for our full line of custom designed products, as well as free in depth education and bow hunting entertainment to help you shoot at your best.